it is my honor to introduce today's speaker. Father James Martin, SJ, is a Jesuit priest, editor at large at America Magazine, and best selling author of Building a Bridge, Jesus a Pilgrimage, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, and his most recent book, Learning to Pray. Father Martin has written for many publications, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and he is a regular commentator in the national and international media. He has appeared on all the major radio and television networks, as well as in venues ranging from NPR's Fresh Air and PBS's NewsHour to Late Night with Stephen Colbert. In 2017, Pope Francis appointed him to be a consultor for the Vatican's Dicastery for Communication. Welcome, Father Martin. Thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Thank you to Peter Abdella uh, for his uh, wonderful words. I wanna thank uh, also the donors and the trustees of the Burke Lectureship. It's such an honor to be here with you, uh, especially an, a, a lectureship named after such a distinguished Paulus. Paulus, as I'm sure you know, uh, ran the uh, Newman Catholic Center at, um, at UCSD for a long time. And also I wanna say a special word of uh, greetings to my Jesuit brothers. Uh, who are there um, right now uh, at the Newman Center. And also thank you to UCSD's uh, TV studio for helping us uh, with this uh, broadcast tonight. They did a wonderful job in arranging everything. And I'm happy to be with all of you. Uh, I wish I were in La Jolla, frankly, uh, instead of in uh, New York City, uh, but because of COVID, um, I think this is a safer way to do it. And I joined Peter uh, in asking you to raise up your prayers uh, for the people of Ukraine. I'm gonna to talk tonight a little bit about uh, my journey with uh, LGBTQ ministry. And uh, I'm gonna talk first about my own personal journey. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, three gospel passages uh, that I find helpful uh, in reflecting on this journey um, and reflecting on uh, why it is that we do this kind of ministry uh, in the church uh, and at all. At all. Uh, so a little bit about my background. I'm not going to tell you my entire life story, uh, but I was born uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, to, I would say, uh, a, a Catholic family, but not a super religious Catholic family. Certainly not one that, uh, you know, said grace at every meals and did the rosary and things like that. Um, I didn't go to Catholic schools. I didn't go to a Catholic high school, elementary school or high school. I went to the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business, definitely not a Catholic school. Uh, and uh, studied finance. I worked with uh, General Electric, formerly big uh, powerhouse company, now has fallen on hard times, for six years, first in New York City and then in Stanford, Connecticut. I entered the Jesuits in 1988. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about, very briefly, my Jesuit training, because it's gonna help us understand this, uh, this talk. Uh, all throughout uh, my Jesuit formation, I was encouraged, as all Jesuits in training are, uh, Jesuit brothers and Jesuit priests, um, to work with those uh, on the margins, on the peripheries, those who are poor or struggling in any way. In fact, just recently, uh, a year ago, um, the Society of Jesus, aka the Jesuit Order, uh, came up with what they call the Four Universal Apostolic Preferences. Now, that's a kind of a mouthful. What does that mean? It means the four things that uh, should kind of guide our institutions, other than the gospel, of course, uh, one of them is uh, caring for creation. Another one is uh, journeying with youth. Uh, uh, number one is uh, spiritual encounters, uh, helping people encounter God through the spiritual exercises and Ignatian spirituality. But the one that I really sort of find moving is walking with the excluded, walking with the excluded, walking with people whose dignity has been offended, who feel uh, marginalized or, or rejected. Uh, so that's one of our universal apostolic preferences. And in 1988, when I entered the Jesuits, that was operative. And so uh, when I was a novice, um, my very first year, I worked in a hospital for seriously ill people, really people who had very few people to visit them. They had brain injuries and uh, people who kind of are sort of shut away and out of sight. Uh, I worked for uh, four months with Mother Teresa's sisters, the Missionaries of Charity in Kingston, Jamaica helping to basically bathe and clothe uh, sick older men 
who they brought in off the streets. Uh, it was very simple work. Again, people who were excluded, marginalized because they were poor and on the streets. Uh, and then um, I worked with uh, poor boys and what are called, I'm sure you know, the nativity schools. The original nativity school is where I worked in New York City. During my philosophy studies in Chicago, um, I worked first with street gang members uh, in the Chicago housing projects, most of which I think have been demolished. Uh, famous names like Cabrini Green, uh, Henry Horner. Um, so, so people, uh, street gang members, um, mostly African-Americans who also were living in poverty and again, you know, kind of excluded. The next year I worked at a homeless shelter where I helped uh, homeless people uh, find jobs. So all throughout, um, you know, until that point I was working with, in addition to studying and praying and doing all the other things, ministering with people on the margins. For two years, I worked in East Africa then, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, with the Jesuit Refugee Service. That's why questions of refugees and migrants are really near and dear to my heart. Helping them start small businesses, and we opened up a shop uh, called the Mikono Center uh, that marketed their handicrafts. Uh, then I, that was two years. I came back to um, study theology in preparation for ordination, and uh, I worked in a, a prison, a Boston jail, called the Suffolk County House of Corrections. Okay, so. Why am I telling you all that? To let you know that uh, working with those on the margins, walking with the excluded, has really always been part of my Jesuit life. Uh, I was ordained in 1999, and then I started to work at America Magazine, then America Magazine, now America Media. For those who, I'm sure most of you know what America is, it's a national Catholic uh, magazine, and now we're on the website, we have, we have you know videos and podcasts and all sorts of wonderful things. When I started, um, I didn't really have a beat um, but I soon started to write about <clears throat> LGBTQ people back then called, I think we called you know, gays and lesbians. Um, I don't think we we're using LGBT back then, uh, primarily because I felt that uh, these were people in the church who had very few people to advocate for them. Uh, there were there were very few people uh, I found who were writing for America um, who were advocating for them, who were really sticking up for them. But I would say I never did anything in terms of a formal ministry. Uh, I never was part of a LGBTQ outreach group. Uh, I didn't go to Church of St. Paul the Apostle or uh, Church of Francis Xavier. I mean, I went there, but I didn't participate in those um, uh, gay outreach groups. I didn't really uh, give any lectures or anything. I, I would just write articles from time to time about this particular group. And I, you know, really kind of kept an eye on them. Like uh, everybody else, uh, I think in New York, most people, I have LGBTQ friends and I knew parishioners and people who came to me for spiritual direction. Um, I knew gay priests and gay religious meaning, uh, people who keep their vows of chastity and promises of celibacy, but you know, are gay, homosexual, lesbian. So, but I never really did anything formal. That changed in 2016. Uh, in June of 2016, I'm sure you all remember the terrible Pulse nightclub massacre where 49 people in Orlando, Florida were killed in what was then the largest mass shooting in US history. Uh, it really disturbed me, obviously it disturbed, I hope it disturbed everybody. It was a terrible tragedy, a bloody tragedy. Um, one of the things that really struck me though was, I noticed that um, in the responses uh, of public leaders, church leaders, there were very few responses from Catholic leaders, from Catholic bishops. There was a one or two line statement from the bishops conference. It didn't mention the word gay or LGBTQ. Uh, there were only a handful of bishops who really said anything. And of those handful, uh, only a few mentioned the word gay or LGBTQ. And it dawned on me that uh, in a similar situation, let's say this were, uh, let's say this were a nightclub with a particular ethnic group, right? One whole ethnic group that, were, that was killed. Certainly the church would say we stand with this ethnic group. If it were a church that was firebomb, God forbid, they'd say we stand with our Methodist brothers and sisters or our Presbyterian brothers or sisters, and there'd be all sorts of uh, kind of public statements, but not for the LGBTQ community. And the words that kept coming into my mind were, even in death, this community is invisible to the church. Even when they're murdered, they're invisible to the church. And it really disturbed me. So I recorded a video, <clears throat> pardon me, that I um, put up on my Facebook page it went viral, as they say, although that's probably not a phrase we want to use anymore in, a term of a in time of a pandemic. Uh, it got a lot of hits, which surprised me because it was a pretty straightforward video. I didn't think I was saying anything 
uh, surprising. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, that led to an invitation from New Ways Ministry, um, which is a group that uh, advocates for and ministers to LGBTQ Catholics, to give a lecture called the Building Bridges Lecture, which I did. Now, one thing to, um, to know uh, is that all these things I did with the approval of my Jesuit superiors, right? I'm a Jesuit. I take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And part of obedience is, is asking for permission to do all this. So I asked for permission to give the talk. I showed the talk to my superiors. They approved it. And I gave a talk, uh, which ended up being controversial because this topic is controversial. That talk led to a book called Building a Bridge. Uh, and the book came out about a year after the Pulse nightclub massacre. And it was a very small book, uh, a two-part book. Uh, the first part, essentially the speech, uh, which talked about uh, respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Uh, and those are three virtues in the catechism that we're asked to use when we, when we uh, relate to uh, LGBTQ people, respect, compassion, and sensitivity. So it sketched out how the, the church could reach out to the LGBTQ community, and in response, how the LGBTQ community uh, could respond to the church. And what I, what I mean by that for ecclesiologists out there is the institutional church. So obviously LGBTQ Catholics are part of the church. It was a very small book. I mean, physically small, uh, only 100 pages, 120 pages, small, like a little book. Uh, and I really didn't think it was going to be a big deal. People laugh when I say that. I thought, you know, it would be a nice, maybe a useful tool for maybe a, a group like the Newman Center um, at UCSD, uh, you know, churches, parishes, you know, things like that. But uh, shortly after the book came out, I was invited to give talks, uh, one at the Church, church of St. Paul the Apostle in New York City, one at St. Cecilia's uh, in Back Bay, Boston, and one at St. Ignatius Loyola very in New York City, a very open parishes to LGBTQ people. So I thought the talks wouldn't be any big deal. I, you know, this is, I wasn't challenging any church teaching. It was a very modest book. And the, these things were kind of known. I was wrong. Uh, the reaction was stunning. The first talk I gave at the Church of St. Cecilia's in Back Bay in Boston, um, Back Bay is a section of Boston. Um, we had 700 people, two hours waiting to, you know, have their book signed, people crying, hugging. And it really surprised me because I thought this book is not some manifesto. Um, but it dawned on me that I think this conversation needed to be, in a sense, sort of, um, I guess, uh, jump-started a bit. So the first uh, reaction to the book was just a tremendous amount of gratitude and positivity, if we can use that term. People were grateful for it, uh, especially parents um, of LGBTQ people. Uh, very soon after that, though, came the pushback. Um, and the pushback, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, uh, the pushback uh, was intense. Uh, and it was also very personal. That's what surprised me. Now, you can disagree with what I write in the book. That's fine, obviously. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm not always right. But the, the kinds of attacks that happened were personal. You're a terrible priest. You're a heretic. You're an apostate. You should be defrocked. And it got really heated. Uh, talks were canceled. Um, I had a talk at, uh, my gosh, Catholic University that was canceled. Um, I had a talk at, uh, with, oh gosh, I had some, I had two or three talks that were canceled, uh, petitions, protests, uh, and it really got um, very intense. Um, sometimes priests would write about me. One time a cardinal wrote about me in the Wall Street Journal. Um, another bishop wrote about me. Uh, another U.S. bishop wrote a, an entire column about me in his diocesan newspaper. Unfortunately, halfway through the column, he admitted that he had not read the book, so it was kind of hard to respond to that. But really angry, um, rageful responses. Um, I was at uh, several talks where people literally screamed at me, and I'm not going to recreate that. But it was very surprising and very um, kind of shocking. But it reminded me of how much, again, not just disagreeing with the book, but this kind of real hatred, personal hatred and attacks, how much homophobia uh, and hatred there is in the church, in the Catholic Church these days. Uh, again, not challenging church teaching, but sort of you know, having this stuff as, as a reaction. So a lot of pushback um, and hatred and attacks, which continues today. Uh, the next stage was what I would call the pushback to the pushback, which was certain uh, cardinals and archbishops and bishops uh, invited me to their dioceses. Cardinal Supic, the Archbishop of Chicago, uh, Archbishop, now Cardinal Wilton Gregory, then the Archbishop of Atlanta. So different people invited me kind of pointedly uh, to, to the dioceses. 
uh, Bishop McElroy, um, I'm happy to say, um, what wrote a wonderful uh, article in America Magazine. So people started to, in a sense, come to my defense. The ministry continued, uh, and uh, it was basically lectures and meeting with people and uh, lectures like this. And then in 2018, I was invited to give a talk at the Vatican's World Meeting of Families in Dublin. It was a real shock, to be honest. Uh, it was the first time that the Vatican had used the term LGBTQ uh, in any of their talks at the World Meeting of Families. And the topic they picked was showing respect um, and welcome uh, to our LGBT uh, Catholics and their families. So that was a that was an exciting talk. Uh, there was a protest there um, at the same time. There was a an alternate world meeting of families across the street protesting my talk because apparently the Vatican wasn't sufficiently orthodox uh, for a certain group of people. Uh, and then in 2019, I was happy to be invited to uh, give a have an audience with uh, Pope Francis for 30 minutes where we talked about. LGBTQ ministry in the Catholic Church. And I can't talk about too many details, but one thing I can say, because it's been said in a letter uh, that I was able to make public, that the Pope asked me to continue uh, this ministry. He said, you should continue this ministry in peace. It was a really wonderful um, encouragement. And in addition, you know, as I've said, my Jesuit superiors, including our superior general, you know, are, are know what I'm doing, right? So I, I keep them in the loop at all times. Uh, and then recently, um, I've started, we're starting a, a website called Outreach, which is going to bring together all the different uh, LGBTQ ministries uh, nationwide and worldwide, have it as a resource, um, sort of a go-to place, have news, have commentary, uh, and we're going to have a conference uh, bringing together a lot of different LGBTQ ministries. Okay, so that's a little bit of where I am, a little bit of my personal journey with the LGBTQ community in the church. I didn't set off, I didn't start out doing it, as, as I said, as a Jesuit. I didn't set out to do it at, at America Magazine, but I have to say that I feel like the Holy Spirit has led me into it. Uh, I, I really had no idea that I would be doing this kind of ministry even five or six years ago, but the Holy Spirit, not me, is in charge. And I don't know where it's going either. Uh, so that's a little bit of, of what I do. Now, why do I do it? Uh, it's not simply because uh, of the universal apostolic preferences of the Society of Jesus. Uh, it's not simply because, uh, um, it, it's not simply a, uh, Maureen teaches uh, social justice and social ethics, it's not simply a question of ethics and social justice, caring for those in the margins. Rather, it is at the heart of Jesus's ministry and who Jesus was. So what I wanna do right now is I would like to look at three gospel stories that I think will help us understand uh, how Jesus reached out to people on the margins. Uh, so I'd, li I'd like to invite you into something of a meditation. The first is the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion is in Capernaum. Now Capernaum is a town of about, was a town of about 1500 people uh, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. We don't hear too much about Capernaum in kind of Catholic culture. Everybody knows where Nazareth is. Everyone knows what Bethlehem is, saying a little town of Bethlehem. Everyone knows what Jerusalem is. People will even know what Cana is. They go to pre-Cana. There aren't really too many Capernaum houses or Capernaum programs. Uh, and yet it was at the heart of Jesus's ministry. This was his home base for his ministry in Galilee. One reason we don't know much about it is because it had been lost. Uh, it, had, it had fallen into ruins after a big earthquake and was covered over by dirt and silt and plants. And so it was lost for a long time until the um, end of the 1800s when it was uh, uncovered by some uh, Franciscan archaeologists. And so now you can go to Capernaum and you can see the way the houses were uh, and how you can see St. Peter's house. And it's really a wonderful place to go. When you go in there, there's a big sign that says Capernaum, the town of Jesus. Really powerful for a lot of people when they realize how many things happened there. The calling of uh, Peter. Uh, the calling of Matthew, the healing of the possessed man in the synagogue, the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, uh, Matthew being called, I think I said Matthew being called from his tax collector's booth, the bread of life discourse. So many things happen in Capernaum, uh, and it's just a wonderful place for pilgrims. Now, in Capernaum, uh, there was a centurion, right? We don't know if he was retired or if he was actually commanding a, a, a force of uh, 100 uh, soldiers, Roman soldiers. We're told that... Um, He's a nice person because he built the synagogue for the Jewish people there. It's a Jewish town, though. We have to remember it's a Jewish town. He's living in a Jewish town. He comes up to Jesus, 
Uh, and he says that his servant is sick. Now, in some gospel passages, his, the man's servants come up to Jesus and ask on behalf of the centurion. But uh, let's look at the one where the man comes himself. And he says to Jesus, my servant is sick. He says, but you don't have to come to my house. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Those are the words we say at mass every day, every day or every Sunday, every day for me. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, the person that we quote at mass, uh, in addition to Jesus, is not Mary, it's not Joseph. Joseph has no lines in the New Testament. It's an outsider. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, um, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And this is what he says. He says to Jesus, Look, I'm a person with a men under my authority. I say to this person, go, and he goes. I say to this person, come, and he comes. I say to this soldier, do this, and he does it. So all you have to do is say the word. Jesus says, never in Israel have I seen faith like this, right? And he says, for saying that, your servant is healed. And the man goes home and finds the servant healed. By the way, um, a few years ago in Capernaum, they were doing archaeological ex ex excavations. And they came upon a house with a Roman bath. And they wonder, well, whose house could this be? Because this is a Jewish town. It's all Jewish fishermen and, and their families. And they realized the only person that would have had a Roman bath would have been the centurion. And when they realized that they were standing in the house that we mention every day at Mass, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, they stopped and said a prayer. So Jesus is amazed by his faith. He says, never in Israel, after he said, you don't have to come to my house, have I seen faith like this? Never in Israel have I seen faith like this. He praises the man's faith and he does a great service for him and the man is healed. So now what is the meaning of that story? Well, the traditional meaning, which is true, of course, is that Jesus has power over illness, right? Just all he has to do is, is say the word. From a theological point of view, it's also the power and the efficacy of Jesus's word, right? Jesus's word is sufficient. It does what it says. He says, let him be healed, he's healed, okay? He doesn't have to do a magic potion or wave a wand or anything or have some sort of magic uh, incantation. So Jesus's word does what it says, very much like God's word. God says, let there be light and there's light. So the word, the creative power of the word, Jesus, of course, is the word, he's the logos. So just a wonderful uh, gospel passage and a beautiful meaning. But there's another meaning to that story, which I think we sometimes miss. Notice who Jesus is talking to and how he talks to him. The Roman centurion is probably as far outside of Jewish culture as you could imagine. He doesn't believe in God. He believes in multiple gods. He believes in the Roman gods. He probably carries around those little household gods, the idols, literally idols, right? that he prays to. He's about as far outside of Jewish culture as you can imagine, okay? And yet, look how Jesus treats him. Does he say, get away from me, you pagan? A sinner, right? Get away from me, you sinner. Come back when you're Jewish. I only talk to Jews. I'm not speaking to someone who is a colonist, who is a part of an occupying force. I'm not speaking to someone who commands an occupying force. Does he speak to him like that? No, what does he do? He treats him with, again, respect, compassion, and sensitivity. He listens to him. He hears his story. Then he praises his faith. Never in Israel have I seen faith like this. Sometimes when I hear this story, I think of LGBTQ people in our church who are often treated like dirt, targeted, fired from their jobs, right? Fired from their jobs because their lives don't conform to church teaching. A lot of people's lives don't conform to church teaching. We don't fire them, right? And I sometimes think about our LGBTQ brothers and sisters and siblings, how great is their faith, right? Just like Jesus is saying about the centurion. And then he does a great favor for him. He heals his servant. So this is how Jesus treats people on the margins, outside, uh, outside of Jewish culture. It's an early indication of, of how Jesus treats people on the margins who are excluded, who are rejected, uh, and how we should um, in the church and in society, in Christian society at large. The next story is the story of the woman at the well, the, also called the Samaritan woman. Such a beautiful story. Now, a little background, as you probably know, Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. Uh, that was kind of an understatement. Uh, they were, this was because of religious reasons, uh, centered mainly on where the correct place of worship was. Jews, of course, believed it was in the temple, 
uh, where the Holy of Holies was and the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. Uh, the, the Samaritans believed it was in, on Mount Gerizim, okay, elsewhere. Uh, so Jews and Samaritans were enemies. Uh, that's why the parable of the Good Samaritan is so surprising. We, of course, say, well, everyone should be a Good Samaritan. But it is the person from the hated group who ends up taking care of the man by the side of the road. Interestingly, the salvation of the man by the side of the road depends on the person that he thinks of as other. Right? The salvation of the man by the side of the road depends on someone he thinks of as different, as other, as outside. So the Samaritans and the Jews. In John's Gospel, Jesus is going through Samaritan territory, and he comes upon a well. There's a woman there. We're told that it's 12 noon. Now, why would we care about that? The Gospels don't often talk about time. We know that Jesus was crucified at 12 and died at 3. Um, we sometimes hear that uh, Jesus is uh, out in the Sea of Galilee and stilling a storm or walking on the water. Pardon me, at the third watch of the night. But normally we don't, we don't really know what time it is. We maybe know it's day or it's night. It's 12 noon, says John. Why is that? Well, the woman is there. There's a Samaritan woman there at 12 noon. Isn't that odd? When I worked in East Africa for two years, uh, I would see women, always the women, doing the hard work regularly go to the pumps, the water pumps, and fill what they called jerry cans, you know, kind of big, uh, uh, almost like gas cans, plastic gas cans, with water early in the morning when it was cool. Now, sometimes it can get uh, as hot as 110, 115 degrees in the Holy Land. Actually, um, I'm happy I'm, uh, I wish I were in La Jolla. I also wish I were in the Holy Land. This is the week that we normally go on our pilgrimage. Uh, and I went at the end of August one year and it was 115 degrees. So the woman at the well is there at 12 noon. Why is she there at 12 noon? Why is she not there in the morning with all the other women? Well, we find out when Jesus talks to her because she's been married five times, right? This is a story that's particularly important for LGBTQ people. She, is, she has been, had an unusual sexual background, okay? Her sexual history is unusual. And she's married to a man who's not her husband, okay? So this is someone in an irregular sexual relationship. How does Jesus treat her, right? Well, by rights, he shouldn't be talking to her at all for two reasons. One, well, three reasons, actually. One, she's an unaccompanied woman. He's a man. Two, she's a Samaritan, right, from a hated uh, religious group. And three, uh, she's had this unusual background, right? Uh, been married five times and now living with someone uh, out of wedlock, you would say, or a person not her husband. Well, what does Jesus do? How does he treat her? He has one of the longest conversations in scriptures with anyone. They have a long back and forth. She talks about her background. He somehow knows about her background. Uh, he says that uh, I have water that if you drink of it, you'll never be thirsty again. She says, misunderstanding a bit, I know we have some scripture scholars on here, a little bit of Joe and I misunderstanding. People don't quite understand Jesus in the Gospel of John in other places as well, uh, but in particular in John. She doesn't get it. How could she? Uh, and then he reveals himself to her as the living water. And then she leaves her jug behind, a very potent symbol. Uh, the scripture scholar, the Johannine scholar, Sandra Schneiders, um, said that it's very similar to Peter's leaving behind his nets. Isn't that interesting? So something important for Peter, also a symbol of the entanglements he has, he leaves behind. The woman at the well leaves behind her jug, her empty jug. It's a great symbol, right? Uh, to go off uh, and be what is basically an apostle, it's because an apostle means someone who is sent. She goes off to proclaim the good news to the Samaritan people. So, again, Sandra Schneiders compares her to Peter. Okay, now what's the normal um, uh, meaning of that story? How is it normally uh, exegeted or interpreted? Well, the normal meaning uh, is that uh, Jesus is the living water. It's a beautiful revelation. I am the living water. Okay, it's one of the um, many things that he says about himself uh, in John, right? The great I am statements. Uh, I am the bread of life, right? I am the good shepherd. Okay, I am the resurrection and the life, he says at Lazarus' tomb. All right, so he's revealing himself to her. So it's Jesus as the living water, you know, one of the ways that we can understand Jesus. The beautiful way to look at this gospel, and true, of course, he is the living water. But there's something else that we miss. 
look at how he speaks to someone on the margins and someone marginalized because of essentially her sexual background. Does he call her a sinner? Does he say, I'm not speaking to you because you're living with someone who's not your husband? Does he say, I'm not speaking to you because you're a Samaritan? Does he scold her? Does he say, uh, you're a woman, I'm not gonna talk to you? No, he treats her with infinite respect, listens to her, listens to her story, right? And then reveals himself to her, reveals something secret about himself, private about himself, that he has not revealed so far in John's gospel to her, and then commissions her uh, to be a proclaimer of good news, an apostle. So that's another indication of how we're to treat people on the margins, right? And the woman at the well shows us especially how we treat people in these difficult or uh, irregular, according to the church, sexual situations. Beautiful reading uh, and a beautiful I idea of how, again, we're supposed to those treat those who are excluded. Finally, to wrap up, I love the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector in Jericho. Now, Jericho is the world's longest continually inhabited town. It's still there. Um, I've been there many times. Uh, they have great falafel and great food there. That's also quite hot. It's a, it, in Jesus' time, it was a big town. This story in Luke's gospel comes towards the end of Jesus' ministry. He's on his way to Jerusalem and the crucifixion. And so we can presume that he would have had a big crowd around him. How big? Well, certainly the 12, right? Uh, and then the 12, and then maybe there were 70 or 72 disciples, maybe even larger crowds of maybe followers, right? You know, remember, he would have done many miracles by, by now. He might have been even just healed Bartimaeus, which is in that same uh, general part of scripture in Jericho, right? So Jesus would have been very well known. In Jericho is a man called Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who would also have been seen, uh, according to Dan Harrington, the great scripture scholar and my New Testament scholar, as the chief sinner in the area, because now we think of the IRS, but in those days, the chief tax collector would have been seen as someone colluding with the Roman authorities, okay? So someone probably very hated, maybe he had rich friends and some people that brought him in, but probably very hated and despised. As I tell the story, what I would like you to do is think of Zacchaeus as an emblem for the LGBTQ Catholic. Not so much, not, not because that person, the LGBTQ Catholic is any more sinful than anyone else. We're all sinful, right? But because they feel excluded and hated, they are marginalized. All right. So think of Zacchaeus as an emblem. And I think when we open up the story, it can become very rich for us through those, through those eyes. First of all, Zacchaeus is described as short in stature. Now, that means physically short, okay? He was a short person. But how little stature or standing do LGBTQ people have in our church today, right? How little standing do they have? How little influence, how little authority, how little respect do they get? So they are short in stature. Now, uh, we're told that Jesus is passing through the crowd, uh, but Zacchaeus, Jesus is passing through the city, but Zacchaeus can't see him, quote, on account of the crowd. You ever thought about that? On account of the crowd. How often do we, as the crowd, get in between someone with little stature and an encounter with Jesus? How often does the church get in, in the way of someone with little stature, like the LGBTQ Catholic, from encountering Jesus, from seeing Jesus? So what does Zacchaeus do? You probably know the story. There's even a song about it. Zacchaeus climbs a sycamore tree. If you go to uh, Jericho today, there's a big tall sycamore tree called inevitably the Zacchaeus tree. Whether or not it's the real tree, who knows? Uh, I was there a couple years ago with a friend of mine who you may know, Father George Williams, who was the Catholic chaplain uh, at um, San Quentin. He's been in California for a long time. He's now at St. Agnes Parish in uh, San Francisco. Uh, and I said, oh, well, that might be the tree. Maybe it's 2,000 years old. And George said, well, if it was 2,000 years old, it would have been this big when Jesus was there with, with Zacchaeus. So who knows? Zacchaeus climbs a sycamore tree. He literally has to go out on a limb. He has to do something probably embarrassing and humiliating. He has to go to extra lengths, like a lot of LGBTQ people have to do, because what does Zacchaeus want? He wants to see who Jesus was. That's what LGBTQ people want. That's what everyone wants in the church. They want to see who Jesus is, but sometimes they can't on account of the crowd. Jesus is passing through Jericho and he spies somebody. Who does he spy? The chief rabbi? No. 
uh, another religious leader? No, you, Zacchaeus, hurry down from that tree for I, I must stay at your house. It's a public sign of welcome to someone on the outskirts. Again, notice how Jesus is treating this person. Zacchaeus hurries down with joy. Why is that? Well, when someone's been excluded for so long and has been welcomed into the community and has been shown a sign of love and acceptance, respect, compassion, and sensitivity, he's joyful. But there's an interesting Greek word. It says Zacchaeus stood there. Stathes is the Greek. He stood his ground. It's a sense of standing your ground. Why? Well, probably my favorite line in this whole passage, because, quote, all who saw it began to grumble. All who saw it began to grumble. Showing mercy to people on the margins always enrages some people. I, I experienced that in my own ministry. LGBTQ people experience it. Uh, it enrages some people when you extend mercy or show mercy to people who are excluded, other, different, rejected, on the margins. And this is what Jesus does. Zacchaeus comes down and he says something wonderful. He says, today I will repay anyone I have defrauded four times over and I will give half my money to the poor. Now, a little uh, uh, biblical criticism here, or biblical scholarship, Usually that's interpreted as Zacchaeus having a conversion. And of course, any encounter with Jesus prompts a conversion. And I don't mean conversion therapy. I mean conversion and metanoia, a change of mind and heart. Okay, a change of mind and heart. But recently, and you can look this up, it's the most amazing thing. Recently, I was looking at this reading, which is so near and dear to me. And I realized that this is not new scholarship. Scholars will tell you this, that what Zacchaeus says is in the present tense. Even though in the readings that we read at Mass, is, it says, I will give half my money to the poor, and I will repay anyone I've defrauded. It's the present tense. I am giving half my money to the poor. I do repay anyone I've defrauded four times over. Zacchaeus is already doing something good. How like LGBTQ people is this? Their, their goodness and their charity and their generosity to the church is often hidden, right? People don't know it. And so the story of Zacchaeus may not be so much a story of the conversion of Zacchaeus, but Jesus revealing Zacchaeus' true nature to the crowd and having their being converted. The traditional way of looking at that is Zacchaeus is converted, but the crowd might be called to conversion as well. Now in that story, the traditional way of looking at it is Jesus reaching out to this person who's a tax collector, right? But again, notice how he treats him. Does he say, get away from me, you sinner? Does he say, I'm not speaking to you? Does he say, you're colluding with Roman authorities? No. And then when he greets him, it is revealed that Zacchaeus is already doing something good, that he is already a good person. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. So it's a beautiful story. Each of those stories, uh, I think, shows us the way that Jesus responds to those on the margins. First, the, 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 the Roman centurion in Capernaum, not even Jewish, not even someone who believes in God, a pagan. Jesus treats him with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Next, the woman at the well, a.k.a. the Samaritan woman with a strange sexual history and a strange sexual arrangement uh, currently, treats her with great dignity and respect, commissions her as an apostle, reveals himself to her. And finally, Zacchaeus, the hated tax collector, right, who is welcomed into the community and whose goodness is revealed. My brothers and sisters and siblings, uh, these stories for me are just so helpful in helping us understand why and how we should uh, reach out to LGBTQ people in our church. And to me, it seems like there's two places to stand. You can stand with the crowd and you can grumble, or you can stand with Zacchaeus, or more importantly, you can stand with Jesus. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Father Martin, for this great presentation. And so, Jim, let's start with a question we have. Uh, we've got questions that are both theoretical and um, more pastorally oriented. So um, let's start. Um, there's one that um, I think is going to be really helpful for, for people who are in ministerial settings. Um, so the, the original question is, how can Catholic schools and teachers support LGBTQ students without being seen as violating church teachings? And without losing the focus of that question, I was wondering, too, if you could expand it maybe also to Catholic campus ministry on universities and maybe parishes and, and LGBTQ families. Um, so go ahead and take that question. Yeah, of course. Um, I, that's, a, that's a very important question and one that is really 
um, at the heart of uh, our outreach. Uh, and so I'm, and I'm not challenging any church teaching myself, you know, on, on same-sex marriage or same-sex relation. But we have to remember that church teaching is a lot more than just those few lines in the catechism. Church teaching is exactly what I was just talking about. So it's not simply a line in the catechism. It is the whole uh, encounter with Jesus Christ in the Gospels and an encounter with Jesus who we have to see through those through those examples and many other examples is reaching out to people, you know, is reaching out to people who are on the margins. Also in Catholic high schools in particular, um, you know, kids are not worrying about, you know, same sex marriage. They're not getting married. Right. Uh, and so I think we have to remember that there are so many things that we can do um, in high schools in colleges in Catholic campus ministries that affirm LGBTQ people. So what can we do? First of all, we can make, we can let them know that they're welcome, that they are part of the church, that they are as much a part of the church as baptized Catholics, as, as me, as anyone in campus ministry, as your local bishop or as Pope Francis. And I think the Pope would say the same thing. They're baptized, it's their church. Uh, second of all, we can listen to them. I think one of the things that we cannot underestimate is, is how painful the church has been for many LGBTQ people. I hear every day, every day through social media, mainly through Facebook messages, the terrible things that people say to them. Now, I know with an enlightened group, uh, such as the audience we have tonight, it might be hard to understand that. People say, well, come on, it can't be that bad. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. I mean, people being told they're not welcome in the church, they're not real Catholics. So we need to listen to their experiences. We also have to remember that, you know, for teens and young people, uh, the rate of suicide um, and self-harm and despair and homelessness are very high. And so we need to make these uh, young people feel even more welcome. The third thing we can do is advocate for them, right? So welcome them, listen to them, and advocate for them. A lot of times, uh, you know, people are against LGBTQ ministry in toto, right? Like they should have no LGBTQ ministry. And and they say, well, if we do that, we're, we're encouraging them to have sex. And I always say, Look, I mean, you have dances in high schools. Does that mean you're encouraging the straight kids to have sex? Uh, you have proms and, 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 and tailgate parties and all sorts of things in college, and no one has a problem with that, right? And so it's really kind of targeting the LGBTQ community um, when, in fact, I think what they should be is especially welcome. So there's lots of things they can do. Um, you can have uh, LGBT support groups. You can have book clubs. You can have uh, retreats, um, and a lot of parishes do that as well. I am literally right next door to, I'm happy to say, the Church of St. Paul the Apostle. They have an incredible outreach program, retreats, book clubs, ministries, prayer groups to LGBTQ people. So we can do a lot and we should do a lot more. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So I have a, a couple questions that are more about hierarchy and church teaching. Sure. Um, so we'll take a couple of those together. Um, so the first question is, Science um, establishing that there's a, a continuum of sexual identity among among human persons. Uh, the question that's kind of connected to that, but feel free to to kind of unpack anything that, sure. that you think warrants it. Um, will the hierarchy ever remove homosexuality from the list of sins, given this understanding of sexuality science is putting forth? Yeah, well, again, I myself am not changing church teaching or challenging church teaching. Uh, but I think one of the things that the, that the church is starting to do now, and especially in the synod, um, you know, other bishops have talked about changing church teaching. Certainly the German bishops and the German synod have come right out and said it. Um, one of the things that we need to do is we need to not only listen to the science, um, uh, and you know, even Pope Francis has said that people are born that way, okay? He said that to Juan Carlos Cruz, who he later appointed to a papal commission. He said that very publicly. Um, he has said that parents should never, um, you know, dismiss or uh, not welcome uh, children of different sexual orientations. But um, to have to listen to science, we also have to listen to the LGBTQ people themselves. Okay, mm -hmm. one of the things I think we have to listen to also is how that teaching has been received uh, and how they feel about that. And I can tell you, and I think this is not a surprise, that, that phrases like intrinsically disordered and objectively disordered um, are stumbling blocks for a lot of LGBTQ people, right? Uh, a mother, I'll never forget this, a mother uh, a, a told me uh, when I was, where was it, uh, Villanova, one of my first lectures, she said, do people in the Vatican realize what that kind of language can do to a 14-year-old boy? She said it could destroy him. So what's the point? We have to listen to the voices of these people. We have to listen to the voices uh, about whom the church is teaching, we have to listen to their experiences 
And in the Synod, we have to listen to the voices of everyone, of the people of God. And uh, that's already being talked about. For sure. Great. So I'm going to shift gears, lenses to the more personal. I have a, a, a longer question. A, a person's offering a, a pretty personal story here. Um, and I'll just read it verbatim. Um, I am trying to acclimate my devout, kind, and loving mother to my transgender child's path. My mother cannot understand. She believes my child's path is outside God's will and refuses to engage or call my child by their gender. This is hurtful to my child who sees this refusal to engage as rejection. My mother rejects my child's transgender status with love and faith and hope that my child will come back to the fold, both the spiritual fold and the binary gender fold. I am trying to navigate a difficult path which, though based in love, is fraught with pain and misunderstanding and indifferent understanding. I'm doing my best to reconcile the very different paths that my mom and child are on. Well, I want to say, first of all, thank you for... Um sharing that with us, I would say the answer to your question is embedded in your question, which is to do your best, okay? Um, if you're doing something with love, and trying to navigate that, um, you're doing your best. This is a leading edge for the church and for society right now, the question of transgender individuals and especially transgender children. There's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding, as you were saying, there's a tremendous amount of, of hatred and fear, especially, uh, and so, uh, I think what I basically tell transgender parents of transgender kids is to just love them, love them, accompany them, uh, help them get the help that they need, whatever help that is. Uh, if it's if it's counseling and, uh, you know, not because they're crazy, but just the, the psycho psychotherapy that anybody would need going through a difficult time. Um, affirm them, listen to them, walk with them. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, I guess it's the same when I was, I was listening to this question, I guess it's the same as, you know, years gone by when someone would marry out of the faith, you know, that kind of rejection. And so one of the things I always say is that uh, it may take your mother um, a while to get there, um, but always be open to her and always kind of, you know, always stick up for your child, too. It's a very painful situation, and I'm sorry to hear it. Uh, and unfortunately, in, in some places, the church is not helpful with the stuff that it is said about transgender people. It's we, what we should be doing uh, is what you should be doing and what we should all be doing, for, which is listening. Listening to their experiences, listening to experts, to psychologists, right? The church, the, we're really all about listening. So I guess my only advice would be to keep loving, right? Uh, to keep doing your best, to not get also a little personal, not get down on yourself for not being able to solve this, for not being able to make everyone happy, right? Um, you can't make everybody happy. You're not God, right? One of the things my spiritual director likes to say is there's good news and there's better news. The good news is that there is a Messiah. The better news is it's not you, right? And we, <laughs> we can't do everything. So I know that might seem, uh, I, I, it might seem flip, and I don't mean to be flip at all, but I mean that to be a really serious piece of advice. You can't do everything. You, you may not be able to, quote unquote, change your, your mother, but what you can do is love your child, accompany your child, listen to your child, be open to your mother changing, right? Um, and and as Augustine said, love and do what you will. Mm -hmm. But that's a hard, thank you for thank you for being a welcoming parent. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanna to say to this group of mainly adults, I'm sure, uh, is that uh, one of the statistics is that even one accepting adult in a LGBTQ kid's life can reduce the risk of suicide by 40%. Wow. So, uh, so we can all be that one person. Mm -hmm. But thank you for being, a loving parent. Uh, the other thing I want to say is one of the best articles I've read on that, I really want to uh, recommend it, I recommend it to everybody, I told the Pope about it, um, is by Deacon Ray Deaver, D-E-B-E-R, and it's a uh, transgender and Catholic, one parent's perspective. It's a very simple article, short, uh, at U.S. Catholic, where he, as a Catholic deacon, talks about his transgender child. It's very helpful. Ray Deaver, uh, is very good. Uh, Sister Louisa, L-U-I-S-A, Darwin, D-E-R-O-U-E-N. She's a Dominican sister. She's very good with this. Also, uh, Brian Massingale, B-R-Y-A-N-M-A-S-S-I-N-G-A-L-E. Brian Massingale has written about this. So there are resources. And I want to say to the parent, um, we're going to have this website up soon, and there'll be resources like that up there for you to see. So thanks for your question. Great. Yeah, and thanks for all those resources. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of people in our audience that will find them helpful. 
Uh, so uh, we have a question here too on the people who might use the phrase love the sin or hate the sin. Um, how do you respond to people who use this in reference to the LGBTQ community? Um, they promise to treat LGBT people with respect and love, but won't bless their relationships. Well, I actually have an article in America Magazine coming about, a, about just that, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. And I find it really problematic with LGBTQ people because that's pretty much the only group that it's used with. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're already calling them sinners, mm -hmm. okay? Now, so what, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with love? Well, um, abstractly, it makes sense, right? We should love people. Uh, we should not. We should not want to sin, right? It's good. It's kind of distinguishing be, between the person and the sin. That's that's healthy, right? Uh, it's about love, and and but it's usually used as a weapon. Um, and because what you're basically doing is saying that this person is a sinner, right? Now we don't say that about every anybody. Let me let me give you two examples that I find helpful. So here I am um, at UCSD and I'm giving a talk to, let's say there are students here. Now, as we know, some 60% of college students are sexually active. That's against church teaching, okay? When I give uh, uh, lectures to students, no one ever says to me, how can you give a lecture to those sinners? You know, well, Father, you know, love the sin, hate the, love the sinner, hate the sin. People don't talk about, uh, about young people like that, even though they're, they're doing something against church teaching or married couples. 66% of married couples do not find birth control. In the Catholic Church, 66% of married Catholic couples do not find birth control a moral problem. Now, if I were to give a talk at a marriage encounter weekend or talk to married people, would they say, people say, oh, those sinners, hate the sin, love the sinner. They would never say that. I, because, and how do I know that? Because I've given hundreds of talks to college kids and hundreds of talks to married couples, and no one has ever said that. The only group that is said to is LGBTQ people. So in its selectivity and in its labeling them as sinners, I think it's really problematic. And frankly, my experience is, at least my impression is, that the people who say that to me the most don't seem to really love LGBTQ people. It's usually said with a lot of venom. So I find that very problematic in its selective application. Great, yeah, thank you for that helpful distinction as well. Um, so one of the the questions, and uh, this is this is reminds me of the, the your final biblical story as well. But are there other people or groups in church history or in the stories of the saints that were seen as living in sin but still warranted inclusion and accompaniment? Oh, what a great question! You know, usually in the lives of the saints, they have a conversion, and then everything's done. So, for example. We look at Dorothy Day, who had an abortion, and then she has her conversion done. Uh, you know, I mean, St. Augustine, probably the most famous of St. Paul. Um, usually the, the canonized saints, uh, are, their lives are, are really sort of, you know, in a sense, uh, heroic sanctity, you know, after whatever conversion. But that doesn't mean that they were perfect, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, saints, the saints aren't perfect. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking to someone who speaks at the, at the Franciscan School of Theology. Francis wasn't perfect, you know, he got angry at his brothers and some tension there. He was not perfect, uh, probably the holiest of all the saints. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that, I think one thing, I, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question. I would say probably not in the lives of the saints, but I would say this, which might be interesting, that there are many LGBTQ saints. Now, how do we know that? Well, just from the law of averages, we know that, I'm not saying that they were sexually active or if they were in religious life or the priest that they were breaking their vows but we probably know that because of the law of averages i think uh, maybe five to six percent of the population even if it's lower four percent two percent would be gay or lesbian okay there are certain saints we can look at that i think i i don't know for sure but reading their lives and, and looking at their their writings and seeing what they did they were probably gay right they didn't break their vows they didn't you know, they weren't married, they weren't in same-sex relations, but they were probably homosexual or lesbian, okay? Um, there are contemporary people who we know who are very holy. Father Michael Judge, the hero of 9-11, was gay, right? He was, he was a gay Franciscan. That's pretty well known. Uh, I just uh, finished his letters. Henry Nouwen, the great spiritual writer, was gay, okay? He didn't break his vows, but he, he was gay. That's in the letters. That's in a biography by Michael Ford. There are many other people who, and, and beyond the, the canonized saints, 
there are many people in heaven who are LGBTQ, who are gay, who are lesbian, right? Who are probably transgender even. You know, probably some holy transgender people who have died that I don't even know about that are in heaven. Okay, so we have to remember that too. That holiness makes its home in humanity. And part of humanity is, uh, you know, as Maureen was saying, different sexual, and to quote Pope Francis, to quote Pope Francis and Maureen, uh, different sexualities. So I think that's a really important thing for us to hold on to. Who were they? Hard to say. But more recently, I think we can point to some examples and say, for example, Henry Now, a very holy person, a spiritual master, was gay, right? And that's important for us to accept and to know um, and to really proclaim, too. Great. Well, thank you so much. I've got one final question for you. It's a question Great. that kind of asks you to look ahead a bit. And then after you answer this, feel free to give us any concluding remarks or insights that you want to leave us with before we close this. And um, the question is, how do you think the Synod will advance LGBTQ inclusion and acceptance in the church? Great question. Uh, who knows? I mean, uh, Pedro Rupe, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus in the 1960s and 70s, was once asked by a journalist, where is the Society of Jesus going? And he says, I have no idea, because <laughs> it really is up to the Holy Spirit. You know, synods start off one way and they end another way. I do think, though, that um, there has been a great amount of discussion of this topic, um, LGBTQ issues, in a way that I don't would have not happened 10 years ago. Um, not only because of Pope Francis, who I think is it's a whole other lecture, how Pope Francis had kind of sort of, sort of jump started this by his appointment of certain cardinals and archbishops and bishops, but also what, but, but by what he has said and what he has done himself pastorally. Um, but it also uh, because people are being listened to, right? So the German bishops, I think, and a lot of uh, synods, synodal listening groups, uh, meeting groups that are listening in preparation for the synod are talking about this issue. People are interested in this issue. And one of the reasons is another trend that's going on. The first trend is Pope Francis and what he's done. The second trend is as more and more people are coming out, more and more families are being affected. More and more parishes and schools and colleges are being affected. More and more dioceses are being affected. Still in the West, mainly Western Europe and the United States, but in other places as well. So it's being talked about. Will things change? I'm not sure because in other parts of the world, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Eastern Europe, uh, things are very uh, hard for LGBTQ Catholics. I mean, really, you know, in Poland, uh, one bishop called them the rainbow plague, right? So the church is going to be, the synod is the whole church. Uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, uh, that we can really listen to the voices, finally, of LGBTQ people. I'll tell you one thing as a, a little aside, one hopeful thing. The synod, uh, the synod um, of bishops put up on its official website a link to a listening session by New Ways Ministry. Uh, which is this uh, group in the United States, right? LGBTQ Catholic group. Uh, the, I, I tweeted this out because I had heard it from a friend who works at the Synod and it got this big blow up and the Synod ended up taking the website down. Now there was such a disappointment and such an outcry that the Synod did something that I'd never seen before in church history. It apologized to the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Issued an apology to the LGBTQ community. I don't think any Vatican official has ever done that and posted the website up again. And now it's just been announced that the undersecretary of the Synod, Sister Natalie, who's a, one of the great women leaders in the church now, is going to be giving a talk for New Ways Ministry. So there's lots of change going on and I think the Holy Spirit is really uh, at work. Well, thank you so much for your time here. Thank you for those closing remarks and, and ending on a note of hope. That's always a wonderful place to end. Um, but uh, once, one last time, thank you so much, Jim, Father Martin, for your, your time and this very compelling and thoughtful message you've brought and hope-filled message you've brought to us today. So thank you so much. And we hope to see you for another lecture. Hopefully the next one will be in person. And, and, but either way, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you all so much and God thank bless you. you. Yeah.